We have education, we have health care spending, we have pensions, and we have a budget crisis now. What are we going to do besides blame the banks? Well, I don't think we should be blaming the banks for the budget crisis because the budget crisis really comes from health and pension spending in the long term. And the next century, I think, is going to be a period of battle between the older generation and the younger generation, health versus education. Who's going to win? Uh, that's a very interesting question. I think it's probably going to be the old people who win because there are more and more of them, or of us, and we tend to vote more than the young people. But I think that's very depressing for our societies. And why do you say we shouldn't blame the banks? Didn't we just trip over and increase the debt to GDP ratio in America by 40% as a result of this crisis? The reason we shouldn't blame the banks for the debt crisis, we can blame them for lots of other things, is that although we've increased the debt by 40% as a result of this crisis, it's going to increase by another 200 or 300% as a result of demographics. The ratio of the crisis to the demographic problem is about 1 to 10. I think it's wonderful. I finally met a man that say that the bankers are the lesser of evils. I think that's true. <laughs> they are the lesser of the evils. So you say the banks are only one-tenth of the problem. How, are we supposed to be happy about that? Well, the banks are actually the lesser of the evils and if you're worrying about the debt and the deficit crisis, because the real evil is the baby boomers, us baby boomers and our so-called entitlements to which we feel we're entitled, but we're not. We haven't paid for our health spending, we haven't paid for our pensions, and we expect them from the state. But couldn't you just break up the medical care monopolies? The United States has health costs that are one and a half to two and a half times any place else in the OECD. That's absolutely right. In the U.S., the, the problem is in the medical system. In Europe, it's mostly in the pension systems. In the U.S., it's the medical systems. It's double what it is on average in the OECD, 50% more than the next most expensive country, Switzerland. And that's basically what's got to be reformed. So you're right. Let's not even blame the baby boomers. Let's blame the doctors. <laughs> and the hospitals and the insurance companies. When we look at INET, you've just written a book. We've got to make research grants. What would you like to see people investigate and explore as they're building this fourth version of capitalism? Uh, I'd really like uh, them to explore the need to create institutions that will use markets to allocate resources, but will allow the political system to regulate those markets and also to create the incentives in those markets. I think one of the things we learned in this crisis was that markets are great at pursuing incentives, but we can't always trust the markets to create the right incentives as part of an internal process. Bob Dylan had a song called One Too Many Mornings. I've always thought one too many markets. The market for making the rules for society should not be a market. Should not be a market, exactly. So, exactly. It's the question of one man, one vote versus one dollar, one vote. And we need both. We need them to work together. So our fallible economists are going to set out at a young age, but have to be politically engaged, have to understand political economy. What other things do you think they need to understand? Well, I think fallibility is, is a key part of it. Uh, as you said, economists are fallible, markets are fallible, governments are fallible. But that's all actually quite empowering because something that is fallible, that is imperfect, has scope for improvement. And probably humility. <laughs>